run the race. It brings encouragement, friends. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, Old Testament, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, who's we? Christians of New York, that we through comfort of scripture might have hope. Friends, every time you read the Bible, it's like going to a Hall of Fame, but it's a very magical Hall of Fame because it energizes. It's miraculous. It's a live Hall of Fame. You're not looking at glass cases of dead people. You're actually looking at glass cases of people whose testimony is still living. So good to be here. Congratulations on your 25 years. And I'm so glad that God has raised up here in Brooklyn, a great church. I brag about you people everywhere. And I'm so privileged to be here again. I um, want you to know that uh, I bring you greetings from Greenville, South Carolina. That's where I'll be tonight, Lord willing. That's where I live. And uh, what a treat it is to come to New York City. It's a different place, isn't it? Very different and uh, very fun to come to. Just a different different culture, it seems. And you're to be commended for your testimony uh, in this dark, dark city. Amen. And uh, thank you for what you did yesterday. I would uh, quickly add that you kind of had a spiritual high yesterday. You're kind of having a spiritual high next week. And after highs come lows. And I'm wondering just what kind of Christian we are. And that's going to be the theme of my message here this afternoon. Just what, how, how are we when it comes to being weary and well-doing? And I want to just use this message and this opportunity to be a coach. Um, the Bible says that all of you that are saved, which I hope is all of you, all of you that are saved are a runner. You're a runner for the Lord. You're a marathoner. That's the picture that the Bible uses for the Christian life, a marathon, not a sprint, but a marathon. And uh, I, when, when I say marathon, people, please understand, I have run two marathons, and I'll tell you more about that here in a few minutes. But uh, the last marathon I ever ran was a couple years ago. I kept telling churches that when I turned 60, I was going to run a marathon. I, I, I ran one when I was 34. And I wanted to run one more when I turned 60. So when I turned 59, I started training. It takes a lot of work. The marathon is tough, people. I, I would caution you, you. There's no way you could run one tomorrow. You need to train. I mean, you kill yourself, literally. And so you have to kind of train for it and get strong on the inside. And, and uh, so one week to the day after turning 60, I ran the Charleston Marathon. I chose Charleston because it's incredibly flat. And uh, the first thing I said to my wife when I got across the finish line was, Lori, never again. <laughs> just about killed me. And that's kind of the way a marathon is. A marathon is hard. Ladies and gentlemen, can I remind you, and I know I don't need to, but can I remind you that being a Christian is hard. It is hard. If you have the right kind of testimony, if you're fighting the fight, you're running the race, it's hard. If anybody ever tells you it's easy, punch them in the forehead and tell them Pastor Bickle sent you. <laughs> it's, uh, it, is, it is hard to run the marathon. And it's interesting, friends, that Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks a lot about sports. He really does. And when he talked about it, could I ask you a question? Would you ask me? When Paul talked about sports, was he inspired? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Which tells you what? That God evidently is a sports fan. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And, uh, but Paul talks about the marathon a lot. And uh, there are many references I could take you to. But I want to take you to one of my favorite. And I personally believe that it was written by Paul, although we don't know who wrote Hebrews. I kind of think it was Paul. I lean that way. And uh, one of my favorite verses about the marathon, could I share it with you? It's found in Hebrews chapter 12. And the whole theme of this message this afternoon, friend, is to stay at it. Don't quit. Don't quit. Stay at it. I know you've had a high this weekend, and that's wonderful. I'm rejoicing with you. And I know you're happy. But stay in the race. Keep at it personally and as a church. But in Hebrews chapter 12, and the, the picture there is a marathoner in verse number one and two. It's a very familiar passage. I know all of you probably have heard it preached before. Many of you may even have it memorized. And uh, But don't let that rob you of a, of a blessing here this afternoon as we kind of examine these precious words together again. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number one. And the whole theme of verse one and two, people, the whole theme, and you see it at the end of verse one, is run the race with endurance or patience. Run the race. But would you do something for me, please? If you've got a King James Bible, do something, would you? The very first word of verse number one, would you give it to me when I count to three? The very first word of verse number one. Are you ready? One, two, three. Yes. Now, let me just stand right here directly behind the pulpit. And by the way, this is kind of off the subject. I'm using all the discipline I can muster to stay behind the pulpit and stay in this area. I understand that the camera that's re recording this is inside this. So I have to stay inside these words. That's what I was told anyway. I would desperately love to be out there. I'd be walking all over the place if you were a normal church, but thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I, 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 feel, I feel like I'm in prison, but uh, I'll, I'll deal with it. You pray for me, but I'll deal with it. But anyway, let me stand right behind the pulpit, which I don't do very often. But let me stand right. And I like this area where I'm standing to represent wherefore. 
Okay, you just read wherefore, right? The beginning of that verse. Let me tell you what this is. The word wherefore is what we call in, uh, in, in Bibledom a literary bridge. It's a technique that Paul and Peter both adore. And what the word wherefore is doing to you, it's, it's a bridge. And it's connecting two islands. You could say it this way, Paul, or whoever's writing this, Paul, they're, they're saying, because of what I've just said in chapter 11, may the following be true. This will be a result of that. This will cause that. All right? They're related. So the word wherefore, Bible students, takes you back. If you go back in Hebrews, you'll notice that Hebrews chapter 11 is back. And Hebrews chapter 11, friends, is what we call in Christendom the great faith chapter. And what you have in chapter 11 is what we would call in Christianity a hall of fame. In fact, that's what verse 1 is referring to. Let me, could I read on? Look at verse 1 again. He says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, what's that referring to? That is referring, I've heard preachers on the radio say, oh, that, that uh, uh, witnesses, the cloud of witnesses, that's the, that's the saints that have gone on before. And, and they're watching the, the race down the earth as it unfolds. And, and they're cheering from us from the, the, the castle in the sky. No, 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 no. That is not what the, that's not what it means. We know that because of the word wherefore. The word wherefore takes you back to chapter 11. Chapter 11, people, is a hall of fame for Christians. Have you ever been to a hall of fame? Have you ever been to one? I was a youth pastor for a number of years in the Springfield, Massachusetts area. Springfield, Massachusetts is famous because that's where the basketball hall of fame was, is. I, being a youth pastor, planned an activity one time where I took the teenagers to the Hall of Fame. And then afterwards, we went back to the church, had pizza and Coke. And then I had a, I, I brought in a pastor who had played college basketball, a really good player, uh, to be our speaker. It was, it was a fun activity. But let me tell you what happened. We got to, we got to the Hall of Fame, and I, I had a group rate. So I laid all the tickets out on the counter, and, and the teenagers, probably about 20 of them, that we, all, we were all standing there. And I, I, got, I got the tickets all situated. And then I said to the teenagers, I said, young people, it is right now 3.30. I want all of you back here where you're standing at 5 o'clock. Please don't leave the building. Watch your testimony. Keep your hands off where you're supposed to keep your hands off. But just uh, enjoy the building. And, uh, but, but be here. Don't leave the building. But be here at 5 o'clock. What time? 5 o'clock, Pastor Mike. Yes, okay. Now I want you back here. Okay, so boom, they took off. And you know how teenagers are. Maybe you don't. Let me help you. Get away from the adults, the old people. And they were gone. Poof. I'm standing there with my wife. My wife didn't always come on the youth activities, but whenever my wife comes, wherever I go with my wife, I have to behave myself. I don't like that, but I have to behave myself. I have to obey the signs. I have to obey the instructions. She's very, very good. She's a good person. Well, the sign said, follow the yellow line. Well, I didn't want to follow it, but I'm with my wife. So we followed the yellow line. The yellow line took us through some double doors into a massive room. The yellow line took us up to a wall, and there in the wall was a big glass case, and inside that glass case was a pair of high-top Converse sneakers that you people could have used as kayaks. They were massive. A pair of shorts that you could use at the pup tent, uh, a jersey that would easily be a flag, uh, with sweatbands, and all kinds of pictures of the guy that wore that uniform. And then there was a plaque next to the glass case that talked about the career of Wilt Chamberlain. Well, folks, let me be honest with you. I'm a sports fan. I knew all about Will Chamberlain, but my wife, who's very, very intelligent, very informed, likes to read that kind of stuff, and, you know, opposites attract. And so uh, she, um, she we, I stood there very patiently, and my, my wife read about the career of Will Chamberlain. The yellow line then took us to the next glass case. There was, there was Will Chamberlain's nemesis. His name is Bill Russell. His shoes, his shorts, his jersey, autographs. I mean, basketball, he autographed. Uh, pictures of him winning trophies. I mean, uh, really it's kind of a nice presentation, but I already knew all about Bill Russell. But I patiently, as a loving husband, waited for my wife to read about the career of Bill Russell. The yellow line took us to the next glass case about Walt Frazier, who played for the New York Knicks. Congratulations. He's in the Hall of Fame. And I, my wife read, well, finally, after about 20 minutes of this, I said to my wife, Lori, it's always good to remember their name, isn't it? Um, Lori, I probably should go check on the teenagers. She said, I know what you're up to. You're bored, aren't you? I said, yeah, I kind of am, but I really should check on them. She said, okay, you go. I'll stay here, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'll be in here. You do do it, do, 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 do your thing. She's very, very loving. So I went out to the rest of the Hall of Fame, and I went into the hallway and couldn't find the guys. Some of the girls were there. They were already bored. They were sitting on a bench, and but I couldn't find the guys. I went all over the first floor. Couldn't find them. I went to the second floor. Couldn't find them. 
Like those turkeys, I bet they left the building. They, they, they would do that. And I couldn't find them. Went to the third floor, the top floor. And, and the last room I went into, let me tell you what happened. I walked into the door, a room about the size of the room you're sitting in. I walked in the door and immediately I was on a conveyor belt. The conveyor belt was slowly moving, and in front of the conveyor belt was a whole rack of basketballs. And out here where you people were sitting were rims and backboards, baskets of various sizes, various heights, various distances. And you could take one of those basketballs that was constantly being fed, that rack. You could take a basketball and shoot at any hoop you wanted to shoot at. It was kind of fun. That's where all the guys were. And I found out that if you stayed on that conveyor belt, when you got to the end, you went out a door. If you ran around the back wall, you could get right back on the conveyor belt. And I'm going to be honest with you. That's where I spent the rest of my time at the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and I'm sharing that silly little illustration with you because, friends, I want to say something that's going to shock you. I have nothing in common with that world. I have never played a minute in the NBA. I'm a short little white dude. I have never been a good basketball player. And I don't have a whole lot. And friends, could I make an announcement? I have no desire to go back. No desire. I mean, if you're into it, fine. Do your thing. I have no desire because I don't have a whole lot in common. But people, could I tell you about another Hall of Fame that I love? It's called Hebrews chapter 11. And let me tell you what you're doing in Hebrews 11. You're following a red line. They call it the trail of blood. And we were following that red line, and immediately as you read Hebrews 11, you're, you're immediately to a glass case called Abraham, who just like you people had never seen God. He had never seen Jesus Christ. But by faith, he wanted to please the Lord. You go to another glass case. That, that glass case is called uh, uh, Noah. Noah never saw God. He never saw Jesus this side of eternity. But by faith, obeyed the word of God. You go to glass case after glass case after glass case in Hebrews 11. And let me tell you what happens, Christians. When you read those class cases, when you read those lives, it brings encouragement to you to do what? Run the race, just like they did. Don't quit, just like they did. Run the race. It brings encouragement, friends. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, Old Testament, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, who's we? Christians of New York, that we, through comfort of Christians, might have hope. Friends, every time you read the Bible, it's like going to a Hall of Fame, but it's a very magical Hall of Fame because it energizes. It's miraculous. It's a live Hall of Fame. You're not looking at glass cases of dead people. You're actually looking at glass cases of people whose testimony is still living. It's a living book. And when you spend time in the Bible, friends, I don't care who you are, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, the Bible always energizes. So whenever you read the Bible, you're going into a hall of fame that will energize you and help you to run the race, run the race. People, it's God's will for every one of us that are saved in this room to be a marathoner. Don't quit. Don't quit. They tell me the average tenure of a church member like you is five years, and then they quit. Latest statistic on your teenagers, by the way, church, we're talking about fundamental churches. 90% of your young people, when they graduate from high school, will not attend a Bible-believing church. They are the opposite of being a marathoner. A marathoner, one of the ways you know you're really saved, young people, is even if your parents don't make you, you want to come to church. Even though there's nobody there to check on you, you want to talk about the Lord. My friend, one of the ways we know we're saved is by our endurance. That's what the word patience means. It means we don't quit. We just keep on keeping on no matter what anybody thinks, no matter how much persecution, no matter how hard life gets. We just keep running the race. And my friend, you can't run that race like God wants you to unless you spend time in this magical, miraculous, God-given Hall of Fame called the Word of God. Could I get an amen? amen? We're all about the Bible. So go back to verse number one, would you please? I have you in Hebrews 11. He says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of windows, that that's nothing but a Hall of Fame, people. It's the Word of God. Let us, here's what it's going to encourage us to do. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily attack us, that's what the word beset means, and let us run with endurance, with patience, the race that is set before us. Let me highlight a couple things, could I please? In order to be the right kind of runner, you got to lay aside. Did you see that? Right there, lay aside. You have to lay aside stuff. This is stuff that you were born wearing. It's stuff that's magnetic. It chases you around. We're all really good at wearing that weight. We're all really good at sin. And in order to be the right kind of runner, Christian, you got to learn how to lay aside weights and sin. Weights and sin. Can I help you understand that? Years ago, my wife and I lived in Boston. I was going to grad school there, one of my master's degrees in music, and I got that at Boston University. And, 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 and we were up there. Neither one of us had ever lived anywhere close to Boston. 
We had no friends, but I heard about a small little Baptist church and we became active members there. And, and, and the church made me their youth pastor and music pastor, but it was a tiny church, didn't afford a whole lot of fellowship. But, but one cold January day in, in our little apartment there in Boston, my phone rang. It was my father-in-law way back in Greenville. He was on faculty at Bob Jones University. He started their journalism program. And he said, Michael, would it be okay if, you, if, if your mother-in-law and I came up there to visit the two of you? I immediately say, Dad, yes, please come. We're kind of lonely. It'll be great to see you. When are you coming? In a couple of weeks? He said, no, we can't. Now, this is January. He said, we can't get time off until April. So we're going to come up in April. That's okay. I said, Dad, we'll love to see you. Yes, well, we, I've got a one-bedroom apartment. We'll figure out something. He then said this, people. He then said, Michael, while we're up there, I would like to run the Boston Marathon. Is that okay with you? People, I had no idea how big the Boston Marathon is to Boston, nor to you. I will help you. I had no idea just how big this thing was. And so when he said, I want to run the Boston Marathon, I said, sure, Dad, run your little race. That's great. We'll get you out to the top, you know, starting line. So I'm at, no big deal. Well, folks, as that day got closer, they always run the Boston Marathon on a holiday that you do not have in New York. They have it in Massachusetts and Maine. They always run the Boston Marathon on what is called Patriots Day. It's always a Monday in April. No school, no work. I loved it already. But they always run the Boston Marathon, the granddaddy of all. They always run it on Patriots Day. So that day, that Monday came around. And we drove out to Hopkins in Massachusetts. I so would love to walk over there, but you won't let me. But anyway, they always start it in Hopkins in Massachusetts, way out here. They run 26.2 miles. They finish at the, at, the, at the base of the Prudential skyscraper. There's a permanent yellow line painted in the four-lane highway. It's kind of a tourist attraction. They always finish. The, so we got, we got out to Hopkinton, Massachusetts, all four of us, my mother-in-law, my wife, and my father-in-law and me. We got out there, and I immediately started thinking, wait a minute, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding a parking spot. This is kind of a big deal. I finally found a parking spot, and no sooner did I open my door when I was hit with this festive air. There were pet bands everywhere. There were circus tents everywhere. They were giving away free stuff. There were runners all over the place, over 20,000 from all over the world. They're, they're warming up. You know, they got sweatsuits on and gloves and hats because it was kind of chilly. And they're warming up. And, and they were doing something up there that I have never seen before or since in New England. They were being friendly to each other. <laughs> I saw runners running by each other. You know, hey, where are you from? Well, I'm from Kenya. Well, good luck. You'll probably win. Where are you from? Well, I, I'm, I'm from Poland. Oh, make sure you run the right direction. You know, but, 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 uh, um, that was just a joke. So forgive me. But uh, anyway, I heard uh, I heard the public address announcer say, 30 minutes until race time. All these runners, including my father-in-law, started to gather behind the starting line. It will take people 45 minutes for all the runners to get across the starting line when the gun goes off. They have little computer chips in their soles of their shoes so the clock knows when you cross the starting line and when you cross the finish line. Kind of very sophisticated. Anyway. So they announced it, 30 minutes until race time. I got their bright idea, people. I had a camera. I thought, you know what? I'm going to walk down the race course about 100 yards. I'm going to get a good spot on the curb and get a picture of my father-in-law as he runs by. That was my plan. I never did see him, but that was my plan. I got a, I got a good spot on the curb, fought off a couple of women, got a good spot on the curb, and I waited and waited, and finally the gun went off, and you heard a shouting in the crowd. They're so happy to finally get this thing on. There are so many runners, and the ground trembles, and here they came. So I see a head. Just hooting and hollering, and the guys up front, man, they went by. They were fast, and and a sea of heads. And I'm looking for my father-in-law. Where, where, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And all of a sudden, at that precise moment, church, and this is why I'm sharing this with you. At that moment, the air above me started getting filled with clothing, sweatpants, fling, <laughs> coat, fling, jacket, sweatshirt, fling, fling, gloves, hat, fling, 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 fling. There were women, New England women, ready for this. They had Walmart shopping bags and they were scurrying all over the grass, picking up all this free clothing. I remember turning around thinking, you losers, get some class for crying out loud. <laughs> I must confess I got a beautiful red, red windbreaker that way. It felt <laughs> right in my, fit me perfectly, waterproof, and wore that thing for years. But friends, let me tell you what's happening. Just, just, just in case I've lost you, let me explain to you what's going on because I myself ran a marathon later. Let me tell you what happens. When you run a marathon, you get warmed up. You know you're ready to go when you have a light coat of perspiration and, and you step up to the starting line because the race starts at 8 a.m. And, and if it's a perfect day for a marathon, it's cold. It's, it's a very cool. And you're in shorts and a T-shirt. The lighter, the better. And, 
and you step up to the starting line, you're ready to get it on. And sometimes it takes the race organizers a couple minutes to 10 minutes to 50 minutes to get their, get their act together before the gun goes off. And, and you're standing there in a cold breeze. And folks, it is miserable. It is cold. So what you do, a little trick taught to me by my father-in-law who ran 47 marathons. He's with the Lord now. The little trick I learned from him, and marathoners will do this, is you wear some extra gear. Some extra, you know, a sweatshirt just to stay comfy. But you know from your experience, you know from your training, that if you were to keep that sweatshirt on, you're going to overheat. You're probably not going to finish. You're certainly not going to have a good race time. So you purposely wear something that's kind of junky. Purposely something that once the race starts, you take that thing off and just you just throw it away. Just throw it into the wind. Well, friends, that is what the Bible means when it says lay aside. Now that you're on the team, now that you belong to Jesus Christ, and I hope you do, amen. Now that you belong to Jesus Christ, there's stuff that now that you're his and now that you're in the marathon, you got to lay aside. You got to take that. If you don't, you're not going to be a good Christian. You're not going to have a good running. You're not going to have a good testimony. You got to learn how to lay it aside. You got to learn how to dress yourself, Christian. And that's what that word in verse number one, lay aside means. And now that you're saved, if you're going to be the right kind of runner, you got to take off. And what does he say? Wait and sin. Wait and sin. Folks, there's nobody in here that knows the Lord that doesn't have a fight with sin. Sin will always render you a bad runner. It will always get you to slow down. It will always get you to stop. It will always get you to stop serving the Lord. Sin is the biggest enemy in this room. And it's all you, friend. You're commanded by the Lord to lay aside sin. Why? Because it will attack. Church, you are going to get attacked. You are being attacked. You have an enemy that hates this church. You have an enemy that hates you. You've also got another enemy that wants to get the best of you. It's called your flesh. And now that you're saved, you've got to learn how to lay it aside, take it off, get rid of it out of your life, and it's going to chase you. It's a constant, I die daily, Paul said. It's a constant, constant fight. And friends, you've got to understand, nobody here, even your pastor, even his wife, even your deacons, even your Sunday school, you all have an enemy called sin in your life, and you've got to learn how to say, no. I'm not going to let you attack me. No, I'm going to say no. Friends, I, I, I so know what this means. And I hope I'm getting this across clearly here this afternoon. But I don't know what it is. I'm a long distance runner. I, I'll, I'll run probably three or four miles tomorrow. I don't run as much as I used to. But I, I, I've been running for decades. And my father-in-law got me into it. And, and I, folks, I don't know what it is about runners and dogs. But I have been attacked so many. You have no idea. I don't know what it is about dogs and runners. I don't know if they smell steak sauce on our legs. I, I don't know. I have been attacked. And it, folks, it doesn't matter the size of dog. It can be a little chihuahua. It doesn't matter. They, they come at you. I have been attacked so many. You have no idea. So many. And the owners always say the same thing. Oh, he's never done that before. Oh, thanks. Glad, glad to be the guinea pig. When my wife and I were newlyweds, I was working in a sporting goods store, coaching soccer, playing a lot of tennis. I was very athletic back then and uh, also playing professionally in the Greenville Symphony trumpet. And uh, in our little chalet where we lived in our, in our first year of marriage, there was a golf course not far away. And I found a four mile loop that I would run maybe every other day around this golf course right at the base of Paris Mountain. For those of you that are familiar with Greenville, it was a wonderful run. And I, I would always find golf balls. I had a five-gallon bucket full of them that I had found. And, and, uh, but I would run right along the base of Parish Mountain, right by the mansion of Cliff Barrows. For those of you that are familiar with Billy Graham's ministry, he was a song leader. Matt, he had a mansion there. And it was a beautiful run, beautiful. But every day when I would run that, I would come to a corner. If I turned this way, which I usually did, it's a four-mile run. If I kept going and then around that way, it became a six-mile run. So I usually did the four-mile run. And whenever I would turn the corner, am I okay? When I would turn the corner to go this way, right here, right here sat a house. And in the backyard of that house was a pit bull. And it was mean, people. And I know this person. I'll tell you why. I would turn the corner, and it would already hear me coming. And it would, it would, it would, it would be coming at me like a heat-seeking missile. Hackles up, drool. But it would never remember when I'm on a leash. And it would get to the end of that leash and you'd hear this. And the thing would fly up in the air, land on its behind in red dust. And here's a fascinating thing, people. It would back up and do it again, over and over again. I got fascinated by this. And I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to. I would taunt it. 
Better out to you too. Better out. I'm a jerk. No, no question. One day, I'm on that run. One day, I turn the corner, looking forward to their show by the idiot. And here's coming at me, loose. Now, you people, you people are all sitting in comfy chairs right now. You're going to have a hard time empathizing. But in my heart of hearts, I know, I know, I'm dead. I'm going to die. This thing's going to kill me. And I deserve it. He's going to kill me. I, I looked around for rocks or sticks to protect myself. And, of course, there was a shortage of them that day in Greenville. And, 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 uh, and when, that, when that dog got about from there to me, it lunged from my throat. Now, I'm 26 years old. I'm a whole lot stronger than I am now. But I saw it come in, I took my arms and I went Rrr! just like that, as hard as I could. And I knocked the dog off center and it bit and clamped hard on my shoulder. The momentum just about knocked me over. It lost its grip and went rolling. It had been going so fast. It went rolling on along the pavement. I'm starting to back up for more fight. The adrenaline is pumping, as you can imagine. And all of a sudden, providentially, a little white car came screeching to a halt between me and that dog and a woman jumped out of the passenger seat and grabbed me and literally threw me in her back seat. She was a big lady, come on. But she threw me in her back seat. And I'm sitting in the back seat of this strange car. I've just have had, I've just had a near-death experience. And so, folks, I'm literally doing this. And I kept dabbing my shoulder because I know there's carnage. It got me good. I could feel it. I'm looking at the thing in the emergency room, you know, what, what, what are we going to have to do here? And, and, and the lady heard me and she saw me doing this and she turned around and she said, Mike, no, she didn't know my name. She said, son, relax. We had its teeth pulled. <laughs> that dumb dog church tried to gum me to death. <laughs> they drove me a couple hundred yards down the road and told me to have a good day. And I'm going to confess something right now. I never ran that loop again. It scared me so bad. <laughs> and I share that story, folks, with you because what a picture of you. What a picture of you, Christian. You're being attacked. If you're trying to live for the Lord, if you're trying to have victory in your life, you are getting attacked by sin. But I want to comfort you with something this afternoon, church. You have a Savior. Hope you know him. You've got a Savior who's removed the teeth. There is no sin, Christian, that you can't have victory over men. Latest statistic, pastor of your church, that 80%, 70 to 80% of your men have dabbled in pornography in the last month. That's in a fundamental Bible-believing church. What a dog. What a dog. And it will always attack and it will always go for carnage. But men, you've got a savior who's removed the teeth. There's no sin, lady. There's no sin, sir. There's no son, young, sin, young people, that you can't have victory over with the help of God's word and your, your prayer life. You can have victory. You've got a Savior who's removed the teeth. Oh, what a comfort. What a comfort. You've got a Savior, church, that has removed the teeth. There's no reason why you shouldn't be having victory, sir, in every area of your life, teenager. God wants you to have victory, and you're not going to be the right kind of runner until you do have victory. Can I get an amen? God wants you to be victorious over sin and all the worldly concerns that come with it. That's what he's talking about in verse 1. But I love, I love what it says there in that last phrase of verse one. And let us run with patience. The, that means endurance. That's marathoning. And run with patience the race that is set before. Can I, remember, can I remind you that you've got a savior, people, that wants to build your patience. He wants to build your endurance. Could you finish a verse for me, please? The Bible says in James chapter one, verse 20, but count it all joy. How's it go? Um, um, oh, oh, let, let, let me find it. And when I get in front of good-looking people, my memory goes out the door. Um, okay, here we go. Verse number, th yeah, verse number three. Okay, listen carefully. Knowing this, he's talking about trials. Knowing this, I love that knowing this. That's the King James way of saying this. Duh. Duh, Christian. Come on, you should know this. Duh. Knowing this, that the trying or the testing of your faith worketh patience. That's the same word. It means endurance. You've got to save your people that wants to build your endurance. What is endurance? What is it? It's inner strength. My father-in-law told me one time that a doctor told him it's not unusual for a marathoner to have a, twi a heart twice as large as yours. 
Your heart's nothing more than a muscle and it builds and it grows with cardiovascular exercise. And so it's not unusual for a marathoner to have a large, a heart that's larger than yours. I say that friends, because God is trying, if, if a marathoner walked into the building today, if one of you are a marathon, the rest of us don't know it because marathoners on the outside don't look any different than you. A marathoner strength is on the inside where nobody else can see. What a picture of a Christian. How many of you are really strong in your faith? I have no idea. I can't tell from the outside. It's inner strength. And I want to remind all you Christians here this afternoon, God's trying to build your inner strength. He wants hardships in your life because when you react to them in a Bible-ordered way, it always builds your endurance. It always builds your strength. And God wants to build your strength. And he uses trials and hardships to do that. So he says, count it all joy. Count it all joy because you're, you're in a workout room. He's trying to make you stronger. And the stronger you are, the more useful you are in the hands of your Savior. And you want that if you're saved. So, my friend, when we talk about running the, 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 the race with endurance, how do you build endurance? You build it by going through trials and hardships in a Bible-commanded way. It's kind of like Jim Berg says in his book, he says, and I had a couple of courses, a counseling course with him. He says, if when confronted with life's problems, your answer is not in King James English, you're in danger of leaning on your own understanding. I like that. You've got to save your people. That puts hardships in your life just as a test to grow your faith. Why does he want to grow your faith? It makes you a better runner. It makes you a better runner. And you want that. So, friends, I hope you're running a race. I hope you're enjoying that race. I hope you want to run that race. I hope you understand that you're running for the Lord. Your testimony is keep on keeping on. You don't quit. You don't quit. You had a glorious day yesterday. Okay. It, there's more race. Don't quit. There's more race. Keep on keeping on, church. But look at verse 2, would you please? Verse 2. He says in verse two, looking, and this is always people, a characteristic of a good runner, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Would you look at me, please? We've got the Olympics coming up. May I remind you that you will not see a marathoner or a runner doing this? You'll not see that. Their focus is always on what's ahead. Church, I'm glad you've got a good history. I'm glad you've got 25 years of victory, but our focus as a church, our focus in the Lord is all about what's next. God's giving you more race. God's giving you more opportunities. It's all about, okay, let's continue on. Let's build on this. Let's keep going in that direction. We're looking under Jesus. What that means, people, is this, that everything about my life as a runner, I am focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. What that means, church, young people, listen carefully. What that means is, I'm always concerned about what he thinks. As I'm running this race today, what does he think? What does he think of what I'm watching on TV? What does he think about my thought life right now? What does he think about where I'm at right now on Wednesday night? What does he think about where I'm at right now Sunday morning? What does he think about my attitude towards my wife? What does he think about where I'm at on the internet right now? A good runner is always consumed with what in the world does my Savior think? I want to please him. I want to please him. I want to please him. That's looking unto Jesus. I want him pleased with every area of my life. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Many years ago, my wife and I lived in Chicago. I lived off and on in Chicago for about six years. And uh, one night I came home from the ministry and walked into the front door of my house. And uh, my wife was in the kitchen doing something she loves to do. She loves to watch the news while she's cooking. I'd installed a little under the cupboard colored TV for her, wired cable to it. And and so she could watch the news. She loves the news. She came by it honestly. Her dad's a decorated journalist was. And uh, she's always had an appreciation for the news. She likes the news. She wants to know what's going on. Let me tell you about your speaker. I hate the news. I'm guilty of throwing things at the TV. I hate the news. I hate the agenda. It's nothing but depression. And every night, this is kind of a, kind of a hardship in my marriage. Please pray for me. Every night... And when it's time to go to bed at 11 o'clock, my wife wants to watch the news, especially the weather. I am always telling her, Lori, this is going to give us nightmares. This is not good for our health. It's, a, it's, it's not good. I always lose that fight, folks, because I'm a loving husband. I always lose. And so what, 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 a, what a challenge. But anyway, I came home and it's, it's about 530. I came home. She's watching the news. I gave her a kiss, gave my son a kiss, went upstairs to get comfortable, get out of, you know, get out of what I would get, get some sweats on. I like to hang out in sweats. And while I'm up there, her sweet little voice came wafting up the stairs. She's got a sweet voice. Sweet little voice came wafting up the stairs. 
Mike, please come here. I want you to see this. Well, folks, what's she doing? She's watching the news. And you know how they do it, don't you? They show it at 5 o'clock. They repeat the same depressing stuff at 5.30. She's watching round two. I fired back with my honky voice. Lori, no, thank you, sugar. I'm good. <laughs> the next phrase always kills me. Michael, and when she says Michael, it's over. <laughs> I melt. Michael, please come here. I really want you to see this. You'll like it. So I came down the stairs with not the best attitude and marched into the kitchen. And folks, let me tell you what happened. Evidently in the Chicago area the night before, there had been a dog race at a dog race track. I don't know how much you know about dog racing. I hope very little because it's really nothing but a gambling event. But let me tell you what happened. There was a dog race in Chicago under the lights. And they showed the whole race on the news. The, the commentator set it up. We're going to show you. And we think you'll find the ending rather, rather humorous. So what they do in a dog race is these dogs, greyhounds, especially bred for this purpose, have bibs. And those bibs have numbers on them. And they put each dog in a stall, just like, just like a horse race. Each dog is in a stall. And when the race starts, the front of that stall boom, flies open. And the first thing these muzzled dogs see is a fake rabbit. It's a fake rabbit. They've, they've sprayed it with an aroma that makes a dog go, wow. And, and, and the, the rabbit took off, boom. And, uh, and, and, and the rabbit, by the way, is controlled by an officer in the stands. They tell me that if one of those greyhounds ever caught that rabbit, it's ruined for racing. So they never let it catch the rabbit. But anyway, the rabbit takes off, boom. All 12 dogs, boom, I want the rabbit. They show the whole race. They go around about the size of a horse track. They go around that corner. They go down the back stretch. You know, you're watching, you're watching this from a camera up in the stand. They come around that last corner, and just as they're about to straighten out, you see the silhouette of a man in the lower left-hand corner of your television set. You see the silhouette of a man. And just as the lead dog, and they were pretty tight together, just as the lead dog got in just near this man, this guy tossed right in front of that pack a live furry cat a live cat went through the air and as cats always do it landed on all four paws the cat was cool and fast the cat turned and ran to the wire mesh fence went up the wire mesh fence and leapt out into the safety of the night but in its wake in slow motion you saw number first place lead dog ladder 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 freight rabbit and a peripheral vision <clears throat> cat that lead dog immediately veered off course at full speed and went crashing into that wire mesh fence as fast as he could looking for that cat. I don't know if you've ever crashed into a wire mesh fence. I have. They act like a trampoline and they will send you back just about as fast as you go in. That lead dog went boom right into that wire mesh fence along with all 11 dogs behind him. And you saw the biggest dog pile, dog crash, dog wreck you've ever seen in your life. They're all wondering where they can, mine, mine, mine. And you saw hooves and tails and, and snouts all over the place. And, and you saw, and, and the commentators came back on. They were all laughing. I'm in my kitchen laughing. And I'll be honest with you, church. If that always happened at a dog race, I'd go. <laughs> I'd even pay extra to be the cat tosser, wouldn't you? That'd be kind of fun. But I share that story with your friends because what a picture this afternoon of you and me. You and me. We're in a race. Far more important than a dog race. Not a gambling event because we know the ending. But we are in a race. And we're racing. We're, we want, if, if we're really saved, we want to please the Lord Jesus Christ. We're very concerned. I hope you are. You're very concerned with what he thinks. Your activity, your thought life, the language you use, what you drink, what you, what you your whole life. You're very, very concerned. I want every area of my life to please my Savior. That's a good runner. But every one of us have this problem. We've got dogs attacking us called sin. And we've got the world throwing in, can I use the word cats? These attractions to get you off course. It might be the cat of the opposite sex. It might be the cat of your leisure. It might be the cat of your pride. It might be the cat of money. It might be the cat of entertainment. But I wonder what the enemy is using in your life to try to get you off course. Ah, uh, I'm not so interested in pleasing the Lord as, as much as I am going after what pleases my flesh. Uh, what a lousy runner. What an off course runner. No, 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 don't do that. I ran a race one time. It was a five mile race when I was really into running much younger. I ran a race and I placed second in that race. I came in second place. It's the best I've ever done in a race like that. And the only reason I placed second is because the guys up front turned a corner they weren't supposed to. They got off course. 
They didn't have the race course. Usually they put officers, you know, people to kind of direct the runners as they're coming. And they didn't do that in this particular race. Evidently they were small in staff, didn't have a whole lot of people. And the guys that were ahead of me took the wrong corner. And so therefore I got, I, I got a trophy. I got a prize. I got a Seiko watch for, for coming in second. I didn't deserve it. All because the people in front of me got off course. I wonder how many of you I'm talking about. Right now, as you sit here, you're off course in your life. You're into stuff. You're chasing cats that God never wanted you to chase. You are off course. And friends, that ought to concern you. That ought to concern me. Daily, we're praying, Lord, lead me not into the temptation I can't handle. Father, help me to have the right kind of course. Help me to please you in every area of your life. And church, could I challenge you in closing to commit your race every day to the Lord? Help him to help, ask him to help you to run a race that pleases him. If you're really saved, you want that, don't you? I want him pleased by every area of my life.